I remember reading somewhere he was like, I've never heard Dave Chappelle. Even oh, I, yes, he did say even that. Even I was like, word. <laughs> <laughs> From New York, Ebro in the morning on Hot 90 Let's Super. go. We going. You don't need no prep, Dave. Uh, all right. Dave's on time Turn today. Turn mic's there. There you go. Check, check. Yes, yes. Yeah, Dave, you're on good. time, man. Of course. I'm 44 years old now. I'm, I'm a goddamn professional. <laughs> You do realize that yeah. F-bombs, uh, uh, MFers, um, uh, insertion in any orifice. Uh, <laughs> we can't do any of that. Oh, this is live. Yeah, yeah we're yeah, live. Yeah. We're right live. This is out of New York live. City. Five million people listen right people now. People are driving their kids to school, you know, on the way to work. All right. Plus, all right. we're streamed around the world, too. Duly noted. My fault. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't do anything yet. You're fine. Not yet. Not yet. Dave Chappelle, ladies and gentlemen, is, is doing so many shows here in New York City. I made sure to print them out because I knew he doesn't I knew know. he was gonna walk yeah. in and go. I, <laughs> I don't quite know which show. I mean, I know what's going on, but it's it's a lot of moving parts in this run. So, can I ask you a question? What made you? And I mean, you've done it before, but what is the joy you have bringing the music and the comedy together? Well, all right, just like all of you, I'm a I'm a fan of music. Yeah, and uh, you know, from Chappelle Show, like a lot of these people that I'm working with are friends of mine. If I don't know them personally, then I'm at least, at the very least, a, a admirer of theirs. And it's good, man, when people get together. A lot of egos have to be pushed aside for us to all be able to work together, and it is a joy, man. But that's got—is it like an extra bonus? Like you—you you knew you wanted to be successful in comedy, but then you've gotten to play this awesome sort of hip hop ambassador role as sort of a bonus. Like everyone in hip hop loves Chappelle and is willing to put their thing aside to come do your show, which is pretty cool. I mean, well, it's like everyone in the room—we're all part of the culture. We might not rhyme and stuff, but you know what I mean. Like if you have commentary on a rap record, people will give you legitimacy because you've proven that you—you know—you're aware of this culture. You can commentate on it, you know. But for me, it's I wouldn't even consider myself an ambassador. I, I'm I am a fan like everybody else of this music, and and I'm lucky enough to get to know some of the best practitioners of of this genre. And you have some of these practitioners doing your shows. Oh yes, I do. Uh, some of the very best. Would you like and to it's also the first time that I'll be co-headlining with like Chris Rock. Guys that big don't ever get to do shows together. So like. Me and Chris are going to do two nights together. So dope. We got some special guests coming through. This is going to be a swell time. And, <laughs> and are, are there tickets still available? There are still tickets available, Corey? Yes, but they're going like hotcakes, New York. <laughs> <laughs> Hurry up, get to the internet, run to the phone. Tickets are selling out of... <laughs> this is the official Dave Chappelle taking over Ebro in the morning. Uh, we're going to wake Dave up. We're going to be back. New cameras. Just, what are these new cameras you brought in here for? Well, you know, if you do something this big, you got to document it. You don't do this every year in your career. The thing is, this is a special year for me. The end of this run will be my, my 44th birthday, the okay. last night of this run. Wow. Which will mark the beginning of my 30th anniversary in comedy. Wow. <laughs> yes. Like, who, you know what I mean? This is, if I was a military guy, I could retire now. Right, right, right. Get a swell pension. As a matter of fact, as a comedian. <laughs> a swell pension. I could retire right now. So. I think you could, Dave, if you wanted to retire. I think you'd be straight. Some would say you did retire for about 12 years before. Before coming back. Well, unbeknownst to them, I was slaving away. <laughs> <laughs> I was, hey, everybody, you listening to Hot 97, apparently with hip hop and R&B lift. <laughs> <laughs> I'm comedian Dave Chappelle. I'm joining Ebro and the gang this morning, promoting my upcoming Radio City run, which is going to be epic. Now, Ebro, you would ask me earlier, who are some of the people participating? Starting tomorrow night. For the next four nights, I will be there with The Roots. Join The Roots, of course. Yeah! Nice. Nice. Will be special guest, Lil Wayne. Wow. Ice Cube, Common. The young Vince Staples. Ah. Love Vince. Love Vince. Uh, big Boy from Outkast and many mm. more. And then the weekend, Saturday and Sunday, I'll be there with Chris Rock. Following week, August 9th, the lovely Miss Erica Badu joins us. Mm. And then on August 15th, we have a very special guest. Oh, wow. This guest is so special. Wait, has this been announced yet? Oh, announced. I believe it might even be sold out. And nobody even knows who the special guest is. And the guest is so special that I can't even say who it is. Oh, right. oh damn. I was going to give you a drum roll and everything. I had, a bomb, I had the flex bomb here. Hey, oh, hit the flex bomb anyway. I, it it's, say it's, it's a it's, special guest. It's a very special guest. Well, it's a very special guest. It's a very special occasion. What do you think I'm going to bring out? You know, hey, ladies and gentlemen, Chubby Checker. He's back <laughs> for the number. <laughs> I'm kidding. It's going to be great. Now, Dave, question. Um, this many shows, Radio City, unprecedented for 
A comedian, yes. Nobody's ever done this before. Someone has. I shouldn't say. I believe Bill Cosby has a record for the year. <sighs> That's, <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Rosenberg, you were really quick with that one, too. Right? Oh, boy, yeah. Yeah, but no, I, but actually, I think that uh, at the end of this run, we will exceed that uh, that attendance record. This is pretty cool. Yeah. And all is it extra special that it's Radio City? There's a certain aura of Radio City. That, that venue does mean a lot to me. You know, like, the first time that I did a show uh, that was larger than a comedy club was at Radio City. I was mm. 19. I was opening for Aretha Franklin. And then I didn't come back to Radio City to whatever that run we did three years ago, two, three years ago. Wow. Yeah, it's a special place, man. It is. It's, it's A lot of people don't realize just how long your run in comedy was. We had uh, I had interviewed David Allen Greer a couple weeks ago, and he was talking about you doing show, you guys being on the same shows when you were like 16 years old, 15 years old, right? Yeah, man. I like mean, Caroline's. I'm like, yeah, I'm like... Because I was so much younger than my peer group, you know, I've been around for a long time, but you know, also I go through this thing where I feel like I'm older than I am because my peer group is like a decade ahead of me. Well, as I say, David Allen Greer, for example, you've known him for 30 years or whatever, he's 58 or something like that. Yeah, yeah, it's like it's like that. Damn, you just threw 58 on? You sure he's 58? He he was shockingly old. He told, when he told me, I was like, whoa, he, maybe 60. Shock, that's not shock. I was shocked. I was Jerry, shocked Jerry that David Allen Greer. was 62. I remember one time I was sitting with Eddie Murphy watching television and and like Sanford and something was on. And he goes, I am as old now as Red Fox was on the first season of Sanford and Son. I was like, oh my God. He goes, I am as old now as Carol O'Connor was on the first season of All in the Family. Sheesh. Yeah, but Eddie looked like Eddie, he still looked the same. He really does. Yeah, we eat something. We eat better, or like even four, more money. Four. There's yeah, definitely I, more money. Yeah, De definitely more money. Oxygen chambers, nutritionists. <laughs> that, no, he's right though. He's right. You know, people of affluence don't age the same way as the people. You know what I mean? But Who, I would say, Dave, you don't see, you don't strike me as necessarily a nutritionist kind of guy. Oh, absolutely not. <laughs> but I mean, but I live well. You do live very well. Yeah, and, and and I have effectively minimized my stress. I exercise. And all of these factors, I think, will contribute to my quality of life. Maybe not the length of my life, but who knows? I can get hit by a bus, catch some kind of wild cold or Zika or something. I don't know what's going to happen to me. <laughs> so I just don't worry about it. I just, I just chill and do shows that I dream about. It's like a fantasy show. I'm like living the dream. Well, you know that um, our good friend... Uh, Cypher Sounds often yeah. often tells me about you. His favorite thing about being around you is that you live the ultimate life in that you do exactly what you want to do on the timeline you want to do it. Well, it sure looks that way. It, sure, it really <laughs> does. <laughs> you go to all the fights. You love fights, right? So you always go to all the fights. Will you be at McGregor Mayweather? Okay, that fight I might not actually attend. Because you're worried it could like devolve into like a Bo Galata riot or something? No, because it has all the suspense of a Globetrotter game. <laughs> <laughs> wait, so are you going to watch it at all? Yeah, hell yeah, I'm okay, going to watch yeah. All right, wait, wait, wait. Let's start with Saturday. You guys were both in the building in Brooklyn, yes? yes. Dave, you went. Laura, you went. Yes. Yes. Laura, how did you feel about the fight? Well, I told you guys. See, we had just had the interview with Adrian Broner here, so I felt a little different about him. Like I, I felt sorry for him. If everybody looks at me like I'm crazy because I felt sorry for him, but why? Because I felt like when we brought up the mental health issues, and then you know the way he was just reacting, and you I guys brought up mental health issues. Well, we, we kinda, had to. Yeah, we had to. He threatened to commit suicide. He was. He had to. He put a gun on the gram. It was bugging out. Oh, I didn't know that. Keep yeah, going. and I just kind of felt he like, out. and you were talking about how so many people depend on him, and I feel like everybody's using him, and I don't know. I just, I had this character in my head, okay? You guys went that deep on morning radio? When? With Adrian <laughs> Broner. You know, like, all the time. I thought people were driving their kids to school. And all that. What about all listen, that stuff? Listen. They gotta learn, man. They gotta so learn. So, when I was at the fight, I was feeling different. I didn't know that the whole entire Barclay Center hated him. Everybody, Nobody was rooting for him, and he lost the entire fight. Well, I wouldn't say nobody was rooting for It was for quiet in there, at least on my side. It was quiet because, you know, the fight wasn't that eventful for a casual boxing fan. A real boxing fan is going to at least get caught up in the suspense of 
can these guys accomplish the things they're trying to accomplish within the parameters of a given round? But a casual boxing fan doesn't understand, like, why aren't they punching each other? At one point, Garcia was like, hit me, hit me, boom, 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 boom. I did not just... hear him talking in there. Did you hear Mike? I get... read his lips. <laughs> I saw him say hit me. <laughs> I did not see Mike in there talking. <laughs> hit me, I say. It was rocky dialogue. Wait, so are, are you, so are you, you're not interested, you're not particularly interested or excited by Mayweather McGregor. No, no, I didn't say that. I mean, it's exciting, but it's just like I'm not going to go and, I mean, listen, man. Listen, Floyd Mayweather's probably training as we speak. Yes. And as he's training, do you know what Conor McGregor's doing? Learning how to box. <laughs> right, right, right. So he can fight a guy that was born with boxing gloves on. Right. <laughs> Ten-ounce gloves. So it's just like, he's, I just don't see how McGregor can do it. And in your situation, when you go to a fight, you sit in the most expensive seats in the house. And are they always comped when you get those seats? You sometimes have to pay, right? Of course, yeah. So you have to weigh, if you're going to buy the most expensive <laughs> ticket, is it worth it to drop 70 grand to go watch this fiasco? Now, I will say about the McGregor Mayweather fight, that it's such a spectacle that that in and of itself is worth seeing. That I feel like no matter what happens, Conor McGregor is a very big winner and talk himself into a lot of, a lot of money. It's his first fight, and he gets to fight the very best. And I just feel like that's what the fight's gonna look like. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Do you? Um, we got a little bit weirded out when the the racial overtones have gotten a little. You said it off the air earlier, but I'll say it. Boxing's racist and been racist a long time. I'm going with Floyd Mayweather just because he's black, not because I like him as a person, and I know he's a better fighter. You know, I honestly, man, the racial overtone. I mean, for what I do, my ears are a lot less sensitive than most people's. And in my heart of hearts, I believe that these guys are, are great fighters. You know, McGregor's from a different genre of fighting, but it's not like I don't respect what he does. I just don't think he's as good at boxing. Boxing, specifically, right. Right. So a lot of people will say Floyd Mayweather should act a certain way because of his stature or his celebrity. And I propose that perhaps his excellence is his message because he's really, really good at boxing. Like in that circle square, he might be one of the most competent people on earth. When he's doing what he actually does, he's great. And life is complicated. Everyone messes up in life, but can't everyone box that good? And so I, I enjoy Floyd Mayweather. And I enjoy Conor McGregor. And I, I don't get bent out of shape about things he says because I know he's getting ready to fight a guy that I'm sure he has to feel deep in his heart is going to whoop his ass. And it's a lot of money to take that ass woman. I would let Floyd Mayweather beat me up for that kind of money. If he want to take a fight with me, I'd do it. <laughs> that would be. You heard it here first, ladies and gentlemen. Drum roll. Let's go. Slightly, <laughs> Let's go. Let's it go. would be slightly less competitive than what you're going to see on the 20s. Coming in Netflix next, a Dave Chappelle special. <laughs> <laughs> Chappelle. Chappelle versus Mayweather. One. I wouldn't even get. I wouldn't even get my ass whooped up. Well, you take the. You, Go down? Yeah, as soon as I open the bell went, I just jump on the floor, count to 10, and walk to the back. <laughs> <laughs> Life goes on, man. I got no ego. Well, speaking of Netflix, um, were you happy with the way your specials were received? Uh, that's a good question. You know what? To be honest, uh, yeah, sure. I mean, the one thing about putting anything out is you can't control how it's going to be received. And I think people were, by and large, very fair and thoughtful about how it was received. Are you working on another one? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, look out. There's another one coming soon. Are these Netflix people around us as we speak? <laughs> no, 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 no. But they are everywhere. I <laughs> 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 uh, Dave, are you into the Jay-Z album? 444? Yes. Yeah, everybody's into that. Everybody? Well, you know, listen, man. I'm, again, I, I am four, four, four. I'm turning forty. <laughs> yeah, I'm, turning 44. I'm turning forty-four, man. You know, this guy's this guy's saying stuff that I want to hear, I, and I can understand all the words. <laughs> so you're not you're not a, a big fan of songs where you can't understand the words. Oh, I didn't say that. I mean, but it's just like it's just a record for a person of my time, man. This guy, and it's the first time I think that a guy of his age can make a relevant record. And it's right. fun to see a genre like hip hop be mature like this. This guy, 
Jay Z is like he's like a guy. He went to space and came back, bro. He's a billionaire from Brooklyn, from Morrissey. I I appreciate that. It's fun to see that. And we never knew that hip, everyone thought hip hop was a young man's game because it hadn't been around long enough to allow people to age. But Hove could keep putting out albums like Bruce Springsteen or Paul Simon or anyone like that. Yeah, and to his credit, like for instance, if I had that kind of money, you would never see my ass again. I guarantee you, I would, I would maybe do comedy in clubs or something, but I wouldn't necessarily be out here promoting anything. I don't. Th is he even promoting? He's got. He owns title. He just throws it up on title. Nobody's seen him talk to him. Nothing. He don't. I don't think uh, he's with his babies. He's with the babies. I mean, he's gonna go on tour when he wants to. Of, on of his course, terms, yeah, you know? make a good point. Yeah, I don't yeah. think. Yeah, he's, I don't. See you it. would too if you owned Netflix. You would put up a comedy <laughs> special when you felt like it. Or would I? Or not. Or <laughs> not. <laughs> nah, I would, man. I mean, you know, I just respect the fact that that he's he's been so true to the game for so long. How big a fan were? How early did you become a Ho fan? Because you're a real hip hop head. Were you on Reasonable Doubt yeah, like when well, it came yeah, out? Reasonable Doubt was a big record, man. Streets was watching. That was a big record. I mean, you know, I remember all that stuff. It was, it was, it was dope. It was fun to watch. Back in those days, too, I used to see him around in New York. Like if you used to go out at night, a couple spots, you always run into him. Like during the ascent, you just see him. And he got his varsity jacket fairly early. Yeah, legend status. Yeah, fairly early. He was. He went damn near straight to the big kids table. Yeah, he did. He had a, he had a pretty quick. We run. had big kids table money early too. That was a, yeah. that helped. Yeah, remember back in the day when it was a big deal that he made a hundred grand at the Apollo. Yes. And now look at him. What's fifty grand to a guy like him? Please remind him. <laughs> <laughs> Please what, remind. Did you? Uh, what other? What other uh, recent albums you've been sitting with, Dave? Everybody loved that Kendrick record. That kid's doing it. That kid is. A perfect reflection of many great influences. Like, you know, when he's probably coming up listening to music, I think he had a good diet. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because the way he refines it, I, I like him. I, he's, fun to, he's fun to watch, too. Have you seen him live? Have you had a chance? Uh, well, do the BT Awards count? Uh, mm. Yeah. Oh, and then he opened for Kanye that one running. I've seen him live. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, when he, when he opened for Ye on, uh, uh, was it Yeezus? What do you, have you spent any time digesting the the Hove lines on his album about Kanye. No, you know what, man? I don't get lost in the woods trying to decipher Jay-Z lyrics. If I really, really want to know, I'll call somebody and be like, and ask them. Who's your go-to call for explain hip-hop lyrics to me? Uh, I don't know. But most, if I could reach them, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> you had the chance to interview Kendrick for Interview Magazine. What was that like? And were you able to just talk to him about whatever you wanted? Yeah, man, he was he was pretty. He wasn't a defensive dude, man. I think he understood. I came in peace, and I, I'm a I'm a fan of his. And I think the thing that I was impressed by him was that he's a, he sounded very introspective and thoughtful. You know what I mean? Like I don't think he puts it down. I think he stays in probably a creative zone. Guys, like you can tell when you talk to guys sometimes, like you know, this guy's working through problems that he doesn't necessarily have to work through. He's figuring it out. Yeah, and he's a smart dude, man. I, I enjoyed that conversation. Now, granted, when I when I spoke to him, I was in the back of a car, on the road, on my way to like dinner, and he was in the middle of you know God knows what. So, if I had in a perfect world, I would have liked to have sat down with him face to face and gotcha. had had more of a conversation like we're having now. Well, not like we're having now, but you know, just actually talk talk. But he was very open. I mean, especially considering we're on the phone, and you know, there's a guy from Interview Magazine recording the conversation and all. <laughs> right, right. You know what I mean? It's, it's those those things. There's a lot of moving parts, and and he never put his guards up. He didn't sound tired or evasive or anything. He just talked. Do you believe in the? A, a lot of times in, in the hip hop conversation. People, of course, laud Kendrick for his lyrics. Me being the the foremost to do we that. We, you're a nut hugger. You Me say, being the, the Kendrick throat. nut hugger of a generation. You hear that kids going to school in the back of the car? Nut hugger. <laughs> now we're talking about nut they hugger. They know. All the kids know. <laughs> the kids have already <laughs> learned that. Thing. <laughs> but, uh, but a lot of people then give Drake a hard time because of the thing that was brought out about the lyric writing, etc. Do you think when you talk about all-time greats, do you... Do you use that as a strike against Drake, or do you still you really consider Drake to be an all-time great as well? These types of questions are tough. Listen, when it comes when it comes to art, right? Uh, results matter. So if I listen to a Drake record and I like it, 
and then somebody comes behind that and starts telling me everything that's in the hot dogs. I still, I ate the hot dog and I like it. It's done. Right. You know what I mean? However, if I'm making art, I would I would rather do it myself. Got that, it. That for me, part of it is like, what can I come up with? And, and I'm engaging these people. But I don't mind people that make their art via committee. If that's, you know, I don't know what the deal is. Because the results, like you said, the results matter. I ate the hot dog. I like the hot dog. And, and it depends on how I'm using Drake makes some damn good hot dogs. Uh, damn kosher hot dogs. dogs. Yeah, now, kosher? You it, kosher dog? Well, he's Jewish. Now, uh, <laughs> he might be out here not be... He, it may not be kosher. Are you talking about his circumcision? That's what I mean. Oh, wow. Oh, I, I gotta guys. tell you. I All right, guys, wait a minute. I'm gonna step in here. <laughs> I am not that? willing to sit on the radio and let you discuss <laughs> the end of Jake, Drake's penis. I don't, I don't want to talk about this for even a I felt like it tied together with nut hugging. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I know, he went from the balls all the way up to the tip. Right? He, got, <laughs> he, got, he got to change this conversation immediately. Okay, so Dave, your birthday is coming up, right? It's the last day at Radio City. How do you celebrate your birthday? Well, I know you have some special surprises during the show, but how do you celebrate In life, your birthday? though, yeah. Yeah, yeah it was funny. So, okay, after I quit my show, I don't, remember, I don't remember how old I was or what, but I remember I was like on the walkabout. And I, I, I started riding motorcycles. So I rode my motorcycle like from Ohio, and then I was like in Austin, Texas, it, it, which took a long time. And it was my birthday, and I was riding up Sixth Street in Austin, and I saw some bar, pulled the bar over, and I walked in. You know, it was like late; it was like maybe two in the morning. So one many people there, and I'm like, "Oh wow, Stay Chappelle!" And I said, "You have a microphone?" And they're like, "Yeah, you got one in the DJ booth." And I stood in that DJ booth, and I did a set. And this is when Twitter was still like new. And I, you know, I didn't know that room filled up, buddy. Oh, because they was tweeting like days yeah, ago. Yeah. Oh, he's not going to believe this. He's just in here drinking, talking about this crazy stuff. And I, I probably rocked for like four hours that night. One of the best birthdays I can remember recently. Another time I was in Colorado when I ended up doing a show and Common was there visiting his dad and he came and rocked with us. And, you know, it was spontaneous That's and dope. fun. Yeah, yeah, birthdays, you know, at my birthday, the way I celebrated was I try to make a memory that I'll treasure. Like my best birthday, I can remember my 16th birthday because I had such a good time. What was it? I was in D.C. and a bunch of, my brother surprised me. My brother took me to our old neighborhood. He goes, yeah, man, remember all this? I'm like, oh, yeah, it was fun. It was like reminiscing and stuff. And then the, a bunch of our friends from elementary school was sitting in a park bench and surprised me. And I had a show at a comedy club in D.C. that night. We all went to the comedy club and it was the first time they'd ever seen me perform. It was fun. And the MC was a guy named Patton Oswald, who's pretty damn famous now. Yeah, he is. Yeah, but we, I mean, I remember all these birthdays, you know, uh, comedy is what I like to do on my birthday. Like, I'm doing exactly what I need to be doing for yeah, my Yeah, I was going to say, you're living the dream. You are truly living your dream. Well, the thing is, though, but it's not easy. You know, I, I, I sincerely make a point, literally, I, I make a point to manufacture quality memories because it's the only thing I believe they can't take away from. Give us a little insight to those parties you've been throwing uh, at a barn in Ohio. Oh, which ones? The Barns, other places. The, oh, oh, my God. Yeah, we went, no. You went orgies. You went orgies already. No, it's, it's not, a, not an orgy. It's not orgy. How'd you get signed off on that? <laughs> I want to talk to you. I want to talk to you about how you got signed off on that for no, a while. No, the party is like, it's a juke joint, man. It's like my, we put full production in my neighbor's barn. And we rock out. I got this band. I call a band with no name. Really, it's just a bunch of people I, I poach from Stevie Wonder. Mm -hmm. And different artists come through and just rock out in the barn. But you got to understand, where I live, this is the big dance. There's no cell phones in there. None of my shows. We don't have cell phones. So your margin of error socially is a little wider. If you know that you're not going to get filmed and, and got you. And people come through. John Legend rocked at it. Tribe Called Quest rocked at it. I mean, we've had all kinds of people. Chance, I think. Fair chance before yeah, that. Chance rock with us once. Most rock with us once. Daylight rock with us in London. Ed Sheeran came by in London right after he had done Wembley the Stadium, man. And it came with us. We were in a little loft in London. We just rock out. And you get to see people do stuff that you wouldn't normally see them do. Big artists come. It's like there's no ego. I don't, I'm not paying anybody anything. People just do it. It's all love, man. We all just look out for each other. The pivotal moment in our relationship right now, Dave Chappelle. Wow. Um, you brought up Ed Sheeran, which made me think of Game of Thrones. 
Earlier on the show, I pissed a lot of people off who listened to the program because there's people like, I can't afford HBO, so I don't watch Game of Thrones. And I assaulted people's intellect. I said, look, if you don't watch Game of Thrones intellectually, you and I are in a different place. And my place is better than yours. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I know what's coming next. Dave Chappelle, do you watch Game of Thrones? Them Thrones. Oh. Them Thrones. You watching Them Thrones? Of course I do. Oh. Yes! Yes! But, but I did not see last night. Oh, that's okay. fine. That's fine. So that's no fine. spoilers. That's yes. Fine. How no, many last night the dragons? No, 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 no. <laughs> that's by the way. That's what Alexa. But did. I, you know, it's funny. I I, I got on late. I like binge watch and caught up because I used to be on the tour bus and there was a couple nerds on my bus that always be talking about it. Man, and they you hear bits of their conversation, and dragons and all this. I'm like, man, sounds whack. Got to work. <laughs> and then I started watching it, man. And, yeah, I just got sucked in. It was, you know what I mean? It was, and then you were chiming about the dragons. <laughs> yeah, then it was like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yesterday, Alexa's dad, my, my wife's father, wrote her and was like, she said, she was like, Dad, did you watch Game of Thrones yet? He's like, no, I'm at dinner. I didn't get, I didn't see it. Don't spoil it. She was like, damn, the dragons ate, ate Jon Snow. Sad. Uh, oh, man. But... It's uh <laughs> no, it's a it's a it's a special kind of show. I had mixed feelings about Ed Sheeran's appearance, but I didn't it wasn't care. it wasn't bad. I though. didn't care. Right. This is what I care about, Dave. You know a lot of white people. How much and for the people for the <laughs> for people who don't watch Game of Thrones, there's a whole movement about how Game of Thrones really can teach you about white people and the things that motivate them. Right? <laughs> Wait, I haven't heard this yet. Yeah, there's a whole it article. Yet. There's a whole <laughs> article. <laughs> What is this article in though? It's better. Be it's on one. It's on a black site. It's black. Black, black, tail. Yeah. black tail has an article, but <laughs> no, it's like root.com, I think. Um, and they they started the hashtag Thrones, y'all, and all that Twitter stuff. They they're a part of that. Do you feel for the people who don't watch Game of Thrones that there is anything to learning white people through Game of Thrones? Hmm. Well, why don't we say it like this? Why don't we say that Game of Thrones illustrates certain con concepts that are part of the power, the dynamics of power? Okay. And the manipulation of power and leverage in in high end situations. It'd be like if you made a show about Fifty Cent's book, The Forty Eight Laws of Power. Okay. How many laws of power? He said, that. Yeah, I mean, you know, and white people are often powerful in our walk of life, so maybe in that sense it's illuminating. Yeah, because the article goes on to talk about the dragons are white privilege. All right, then they're going to. They're going you know, to. Because Daenerys is just born with these dragons that you just fire on anybody at any time. She ain't got nothing to worry about. You can't burn her. You can't harm her. You can't do nothing. Yeah, so I got to think about it. I got to digest that. I don't know if that ring, they didn't immediately ring true. And then they said winter, winter, the, uh, what are they called? The White Walkers. Mm hmm. The White Walkers. <laughs> Who are the White Walkers? The White Walkers is racism. It's always coming. It's KKK. Uh. It's, it's always on the way. No. It's always the, White Walkers, the White Walkers are so much more dangerous than the KKK. The KKK are pathetic no, at this it's point. it's racism. It's okay. all of The White Walkers are terrifying. I've got to read this. <laughs> Where in D.C. were you born? Washington Hospital Center. And, where, and what, what section of D.C. did you grow up in? Well, several. I used to live in Silver Spring from like zero to ten, and then I lived right. in the Northeast on East Capitol Street. Did you hear the the really sad uh, DC news from the weekend? That Cool Disco Dan died. Yes. yes man. Wow. Really. The legend yeah. Cool Disco Dan passed away. Yes, yes. I did. You heard that country big? Yeah, Cool Disco Dan. He was a for people listening who may not know, he was a iconic graffiti artist, and his tag Cool Disco Dan. I mean, Dave, your entire life must have been seeing. I'm from I'm from Montgomery County, so I only saw it some, but in D.C., you saw it all the time. Yo, you seen on the bus, like written on the seat. This guy was ubiquitous. Like he wrote on, he just wrote all over the city. Cool disco dance. And then at a certain point, it's like some Turk 182 stuff. At a certain point, people were like, "Who is Cool Disco Dan?" Mm -hmm. And it was a paper in D.C. that went and found this guy. And he was like a street legend. He was like a he was like a local. Like oh, yeah. it was a funny reference locally. And, and he uh, just passed away. Just passed away. And there's a great documentary that came out a couple years ago about him. That's phenomenal. There's a documentary about Cool Disco. Yeah, yeah I'll I'll send it. I'll send it to you. I got a, I got a DVD of it. It's phenomenal. All right, stuff. Phenomenal. But yeah, rest in peace, Cool Disco Dan. Dave, you uh, have some shows announcing today. What's the deal, man? Radio City, more Radio City dates. Yes, uh, going on sale today at three o'clock. Joining the lineup will be Solange. Oh, oh, oh. Yes. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Nobody's heard this before. 
No, no, this is breaking stories. Oh, wait, hold on, hold on. Set him up. Hold him up. Set him up. Set him up. Set him up. <laughs> yeah, you need this. Set him up. You need this. Got out of my thing. Okay. That's right. Salon going on sale today at 3 p.m. Also joining me at Radio City will be select members. 5 p.m., Dave. 5 p.m., excuse PM. me. In the, news, in the newsroom over there in the corner, they say 5 p.m. <laughs> correction, okay, correction. We are going on sale with Solange's show at 5 p.m. And also joining me, <clears throat> select cast members from Saturday Night Live. Uh-oh. Leslie Jones, Michael Che, and Colin Jost will be joining me at Radio City. Please uh, check your local ticket listings. I don't even know. Where, where do I tell people to look Ticketmaster. for this? Ticketmaster. At Ticketmaster. Boom. Ticketmaster.com. Of course. Right. But of course. And all the shows, uh, will there be more added after this? Or is this the last? Well, like, it's weird. Like Some of these, some of these are sold out, man. But uh, on August 17th, Chance the Rapper is joining me. August 18th, I'm co-hosting with uh, The Daily Show's Trevor Noah. Uh, and then, of course... Donald Glover, a.k.a. Childish Gambino, will be on the 19th, and on August 20th, Miss Lauren Hill will be there. And then on August 23rd, the day before my birthday, I reunite with my brothers, Yasin Bey and Talib Kweli. Nice. It's going to be fun. Has talking about Trump gotten boring for you? You were a part of the SNL skit when the you guys did the whole uh, election oh, the, day. Yeah, you guys did a great skit. The the black people oh, watching the Trump yeah. results was a great, great, it's phenomenal. Skit. Yeah, man, that was uh, that was actually me, uh, Neil Brennan, and Chris Rock wrote a lot on that. And that, because that seemed very you, the idea of being not being surprised by that. Oh, that yeah, that's what, that's what you know. The night, the night that he won, the writers' room at SNL stopped. And that was my attitude. Like, yo, you know, I was more worried about coming back to television than I was about what had happened in the election. Right. I live in Ohio. I could see him coming. You knew this was going to happen. I don't want to say I knew. It, but it, you could see that it's possible. I travel the country and tell jokes. And I, I felt a climate where it was conceivable that this guy running that campaign could beat that candidate. Yeah, you could see it. In New York, you can't tell. Right. You know, like all this talk about Mexicans and getting ice. You, you know, New Yorkers don't know what I'm about Mexicans and well, you know, ice, but not like not like Texas, not no. like Arizona, Mexico, Arizona, not like west of the Mississippi. You know, and, and on in the coastal cities, you just don't know what's popping in the middle. You don't know. So wait, that night were you guys still at SNL working on election night? Yeah, it was eerie, man, because the they were doing this thing on the, at the skating rink at Rockefeller where they were projecting the winners of states on the ice. And the windows were open because I was smoking in the office. And you could hear like every few minutes when they call say, hooray, or all out the window. So it was like really like you immersed in it. And there was TV screens. And I'm telling you, as the night went on and state after state started calling Donald Trump, boy, that writer's room got quiet. Like nobody wrote anything. <laughs> and cats were devastated but you know the show went on and, and everything worked all as well and ends well and I, that episode got nominated for an emmy so we'll see how it goes all right silver lining yeah ironically the the episode from the week before it was nominated for an emmy too so i probably won't win but <laughs> but i thought that was dope yeah, this I mean, given good. all that happened that week, I was very impressed. Well, I remember the night of the election, I uh, I was working for Complex doing this party, and when I started getting the information from <coughs> family I have that knows a lot more than me that it was going bad, Common showed up, and I, I went up, to, I went up to Common, and I was like, I was like, Com, she's gonna lose, and that was the first moment I realized that progressive black people, though saddened by it were not as surprised as I was. He kind of looked at me like, hmm. And I was like, my whole life had fallen apart in front of me. <laughs> yeah. And it just seemed like my black friends did not it, take it the same way. It just was not a surprise in the same way. Well, we've, we've been here before. <laughs> I think I, w I was surprised that the factions that control the way things go would allow this. I didn't think he would get as far as he got in his campaign. 
when he got that far, I, remember we would talk about it on right. there. I'd be like, all right, if y'all want this guy to be president, it's not going to affect my pocketbook. But, boy, this is going to be embarrassing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I don't know. I, don't know. I mean, this guy, where we living, man? What we doing? What's, look at all these things that happen. He's just not the biggest game in town. Like, the biggest threat to America is American. You know, when 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 it comes down to it, we either fighting against each other or fighting for each other. You know, and his rhetoric is divisive, but in a world of cause and effect, maybe it's a good thing. For instance, Hillary Clinton didn't unite the women voters, but in the, that Wednesday morning they was united. <laughs> that's, I know it's like, true. Like maybe he'll just save everybody by accident. That's that's what we've started to hope for. Yeah, that we are in a hope. We are we are in a uh, enjoying watching people, because I find myself uh, happy that people have a uh, a common enemy. I feel like right. Like I feel like people want. Like it's the first time in in my time in media that I feel like people yearn for information. They want to learn. I've learned a, a lot. You know, I was thinking about this yesterday. I don't think I've ever used the word collusion in my life before the last six months. Can you remember Never. saying the word collusion in a casual sentence? And now we know. Vocabulary is getting better. Uh, government protocol, we're getting an education because every time it breaks government protocol, they tell us what the protocol is. Americans are learning a lot right now. And it's the first time that maybe a, a, a voter will actually be educated and, and, can, and can figure out how the car works a little bit. Does Trump make it four years? Oh, like, are we gambling? Yeah, over under. Yeah, I'm going to say he'll make it through four years because the the uh, gov the mechanics of government is slow. So even if they try to get him out, it'd take him five years to get him out. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. You know, does he get another term? I doubt it. I don't know who the other side's going to run. But, yeah, I think, he, I think he'll make it to the end of his term. I imagine he would. What you live in Ohio uh, for how long now? Man, I was living in Ohio when we was doing Chappelle show. Like when we finished the oh, show, I, I go back to the farm. Um, Why did you decide on Ohio? Why did that become the place for you? Because my parents split up when I was a kid, and my dad had lived out there, and uh, he got real sick in like '98. So I would drive back and forth from New York, you know. And there's like no good hotels where I live, so I just bought a house there, and then I, and at a certain point, I just moved into the house. Mm. And then when I quit the show, I moved back into the house. It's just like I was just chilling. Because here's a treadmill. Like, I could live in New York. I can afford it, but it, it, I would have to work all the time. But in Ohio, I could do that for a long time in that way. Those, as far as people out there know, I don't, I don't work. They never see me work. And in, and I'm sure the house you got was lovely and, I mean, ridiculously affordable. And you can pay, just pay for it all and sit on it. Yeah, ridiculously full. That's it. Well, I, okay, my life does have its extravagances. I'm not gonna front, but my the core of what my life is 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 very simple. What are the extravagances? I, I know you do private jet sometimes. Yeah, or all I, the time. Yeah, go jets and I go to these great fights and then you know sometimes I peacock a little bit and rock some fly stuff and you know I got my I mean every peacock. Please explain. You know, do peacock. We wear some fly stuff. Put on some clothes, like yeah, show out the fabrics. Little, I like yeah, the yeah. feathers. Okay, it's, it's right, dressing right. nice, and then okay. it's like I'm wearing all status symbols. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't do that often, right? Like, how, no, how, no, no, no. How do you decide no. when you when you're gonna show out? Uh, boy, that's a good question. I guess um, I don't know, man. You know why I do it though? So people like me. <laughs> so I just want to be like like everybody. everybody think, I want everybody to think I'm cool and oh look it's nice album, you know. But I'm not really into clothes like that. I'm not a, I'm not a fashionista. But every once in a while, I just want people to know that I can do that. Do your kids ask you for extravagant things? No, my kids are very simple people. Really? Very yeah, grounded. My, my, my things like fame. My kids don't really have a relationship with with what it is I do. This last year, because things been going so well. They be laughing because they see some the changes around it, but they don't. They're not on that. Where we live is like stuff like that is important to a kid in New York, like their sneakers and stuff. There's very little social capital in that for my kids. 
so they don't they don't trip on. Are you able to? Are people used to you out there? So like you and your kids can go out without you being mobbed. Well, that's the crazy thing. So I live in the heart of Trump country, and yo, know, I can move around, man. People are generally nice to me. They stop talk to me all the time, but but they're used to me. Like you know, I'm just like I mean that. Right now, it's like I'm the Warriors or something. I'm like a, a, a local team they root for. Like they're, they're proud of me. Like, oh, it's really cool. Our neighbor's doing this stuff. And they saw me when I was going through it, and now they see me now. I'm just, I'm just saying. I'm just having a vastly better time. Right There's now. a lot of black people out there? It's mixed? Uh, it's me. It's, it's Ohio is not. Yeah, we out there. We're out there. Hell yeah, we're out there. <laughs> it's like I live in the closest big city. I'm like 15 minutes away from like Dayton. You know, Roger Troutman's at. Yeah, there's black people there. Yeah. You know, it's it's politically diverse. Where I live is is a very liberal town. It's like a it's like a very far left town. It's like a Bernie Sanders island in the Trump seat. It's a lot of red out there, but but in town it's. It's like where you at? People travel. People do cool stuff. It's cultured. It's just not New York, you know. Would you say? Um, I mean, I'll say it, but. I, I want to know your opinion. I believe that you're the most multicultural as far as the people who appreciate Dave Chappelle. Uh, comedian that we've seen in the last, I mean, since Eddie Murphy. Yeah. Easily, right? Yeah, that's, Eddie's a great example of it also. Totally cross-cultural, yeah. No, I appreciate it, man. I, you know what? I, I, yeah. yeah. I, Chris Rock, too. I, I would say Chris Rock, too. But yeah, I think Chris Rock, too. I think, I think that it got... I don't know. My life is diverse. You know what I mean? Like, I see the world. I go, you know, all these guys, you come to the station, we all travel the world and this, that, and the other, and our worldview gets big, and we, and in com comedy, we talk about more things the more people listen to you. The more things you know about or the more things they recognize. It's cool, man. Do you think but it helped that you were like a, the, the half-baked? Yeah, I was going to say. You and Jim Brewer, right? You guys did this movie that was like such a cross, it was just a stoner movie. It was for everyone who was a son. You think that helped set it off in that direction? I mean, listen, I don't knock any of the stuff that I did because everything helped in some way, form, or fashion. Even even if the help was to just inform me about something. But I don't know. I don't take that kind of inventory. For me, like, it's like I don't know. I just remember from the inside out. I don't know what other people think about the stuff I do. And I try not to seek that information out. There have been a couple times... Like I might have drank something and Googled myself. <laughs> but, I, but I try not to like swim in the deep water of other people's opinions. And you, so you don't get over impacted by, by, by reaction to stuff like, uh, you know, I'm a bitch. I'm always looking at Twitter and getting upset and emotional. Comments. I, I read comments. He doesn't ever really do that. Laura's good at that. I, I'm bad yeah, at I'm that. Like, I don't care. Are you affected by stuff like that or you're, you're good at removing yourself? Oh, my God. Dude, I'm not on Twitter. I'm not on Facebook. I'm not on Instagram. I don't do any of that stuff. I, you know, the only way I know about stuff is because everyone else just tells me about it. My wife, this gets real bad. She'll let me know, like, oh, you, you should look into this or that. Or that. Like, <laughs> you might want to research that. Right, right. There's a lot she'll of people me, saying. Well, she'll let me know, but, but for the most part, man, I just, I try not to pay attention to it because you don't want to be careful as a comedian. You know what I mean? I try to keep my business, like, small enough so it could still be, authentic enough you know there's you know you get on the big stage you gotta be a little more careful so i stay off the big stage well while in new york will you be popping up in Tanniel, these local comedy clubs oh, can't yeah. help himself i was there last night <laughs> <See>? <laughs> yeah. Seller? yeah man that's why i'm so tired but it was fun it was it was worth it we got it in we went to comedy cellar last night uh and we went to village underground last night and right before that, I was at Randall Islands. I went to go check Tribe out. How was Tribe? He had Panorama yesterday. It was great, man. You know, it was great. Did you ever know Jerobi could rap so well? No. Did you know he can cook so well? Yes. I, I didn't know that. See, that I knew. I knew that. But when the album yeah. came out, I was like, wait, who's the other guy rapping? Yeah. And they were like, it's Jerobi. I went, like, Jerobi raps. Yo, he, he, yo, his verse was fire, yeah, They were man. good. Yeah. Verse. He got a few on that yeah, album. The whole album yeah. is good. Got a um, few. Dave, uh, are you... Do you have a... Do you have any guilt or concern about your smoking habit? I'm someone who loves smoking. I'm currently not, but I always live with sort of guilt when I'm smoking. And you're fidgeting two empty packs. Oh no, he's oh, you're talking about cigarettes. Cigarettes, not weed. I know you don't care about weed, but we're having guilt about it now. It does. Does it concern you? Like you don't have any fear about it? Well, now we're getting into a more philosophical conversation. Are both those boxes empty? 
Yeah, they're both relatively empty. Yeah, they're both empty. Fear, no. No, I think that if I quit smoking, it would improve the quality of my life, perhaps, in some ways, but not necessarily the length of my life. I'm a fatalist. I think you just, everything is what it is. So you, but why do you think then, then how would it improve the quality? Like, because I could probably breathe better and walk up a flight of steps. But, <laughs> but you also seem to enjoy smoking. Right, that's what I'm saying. So I said, in some ways, it improves the quality of my life. Boy, I sure will miss sitting in that easy chair. That ashtray and just puffing, and and <laughs> relaxing, or talking with your buddy. You know, cigarettes this is the thing. You know, now I, now I sound like a commercial for cigarettes, but I tell you, I, I, this is how I started smoking. A lot of people think I started smoking because of comedy. I was walking in Metro Center, D.C. Cigarette company was doing a promotion. They gave me a pack of cigarettes. At Metro Center. Got I was 14 years old. Ooh. Now, I got to tell you, I Lawsuit. probably looked really young. So if anything ever happens to me smoking related, oh, I'm coming for it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm coming like the limey. <laughs> but you smoked it and you were like, oh, this is delightful. Yeah, it was ill, man. I was even crazier than that. I, I took the cigarettes home and it was sitting on my dress and I was like, you know, and I literally said to myself, you know what? I'm going to learn how to smoke. And like comedy stuff, I didn't realize I'd get so good at it. <laughs> <laughs> because at first, I'm guessing you first took one, you're like, oh, this is bad. No one really enjoys their first cigarette. But I, you I, didn't get you know, nauseous at all from the first one? Well, you know, I almost said something, but I don't want to say what brand it was. I'm not giving you're scared they'll come shot. for you? Or no, no, no. I just he don't, he's coming for them. You don't want to give them a heads up. Yeah. I don't, I don't want them to be like, well, that promotional cigarette pack really did work out. We just got a plug on high. <laughs> it finally paid off. Right. Now, I, I, uh, yeah, man. I mean, I think eventually I will quit smoking. It's like a bad habit. You know, I, I get it. But it is what it is. I'm a guy from the 80s. Like, even when I think about comedy in my dreams, it's, it's always in, like, smoky rooms. Like, the first time they were like, you can't smoke in a comedy club, it just felt, like, strange to me because it was such a part of the fabric of the environment. Well, isn't it nice that you're so famous that whenever I've seen you perform in comedy, you're always smoking in comedy clubs where you can't smoke cigarettes? Well, no, thank God that'll work out. <laughs> I made it just in time. <laughs> Dave Chappelle, ladies and gentlemen, I uh, appreciate you taking over the show today. Well, man, L listen. Anything you didn't say that you want to say before you get out of here? Man, first of all, I appreciate you, Ebro. People don't know, me and Ebro used to hang out all the time with yes. Chappelle's show. Yes. And I mean, we was like, we was like real cool, man. And uh, I watch the show, and uh, I miss Cypher on the show. Yeah, we do too. Yeah, but, but now he's making big money. We do too, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we just, where were you guys? Red Rocks or something? Yeah, we just played Red Rocks yeah. together, man. We've been killing it. So you know, takes horrible pictures at all of do your you. Do you remember? Do you remember the night of the Jay Z R Kelly at Madison Square Garden? When the night he got like R Kelly got maced? Yes, or something? When, yes. when they they allegedly Ta Ta maced R Kelly. Da 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 da. I do. I wasn't there though. You called in that night. Me and Angie was up here that night. You sure you wasn't there or was the next night you was there? Oh, yeah, we did call. I can't remember what we was talking about. We was that. talking about the mo what just happened at Madison Square Garden because we was waiting on Jay and R. Kelly to come to the station that night. The, what happened? What ended up happening? They squashed, I'm sure. I mean, I don't no, know. No, that was the no. end. That Jay was went the on end of the, that. Jay went on to finish the tour, right, by himself with other special guests. And this is before, this is, did the PP story break by then? Before. This, this is just pee, just pee on pre the video. Pee. Yeah, I think just that. pre pee. <laughs> just pre pee. pee. Just pre pee. <laughs> Before you bodied R. Kelly, I mean, you really did. Oh, yeah. yeah, I didn't. You guys aren't close. I'm guessing. Him, body him. I didn't like. Body but your sketch him. was the cultural <laughs> stamp of like, this is what we think of R. Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone but, loved that sketch. It was funny, dude. Look, look, I'm not even gonna lie. That was the one sketch. Corey, you can test this. I was gonna cut it. Cause I was like, but then I watched it and said, man, this is so funny. And this is this is the crisis. Can the can the audience handle it? So we left it in there. The only time will tell if I should have. Did you ever no, hear from? It's done. It's done. It's done. It's it's done, done now. Now. Yeah. Time no told. Time. What time? <laughs> <laughs> what time? What time? You got it right. You got it right. You did fine. <laughs> what time? But wait, did, did, did he ever say anything about? It? I remember reading somewhere he was like, "I've never heard Dave Chappelle." Oh I, yes, he did say even that. Even I was like, "Word." <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> nobody, nobody mentioned it. Like you need even knew. Because that's one of the times my wife be like, "You better get on this internet and see what they're saying." And I be like, "You never heard of this," but it was cool. I mean. Did you uh you you met Prince in in life after the sketches right? Yes, man. Did yes, you guys man. have like a relationship, a rapport? Uh, yeah, I'd say so. Yeah, very much. You know what? Even back when I was like working in clubs in New York, Prince used to come check me out. Like before people was really on me. Prince was always a little ahead of stuff. He was on me, but when I quit my show, I think we became like friends. He, he reached out. Yeah, yeah. Prince respects yeah. that. Yeah, Prince exactly respected right. that. He like, respected that. That was like he knew I was, that was going through my grown man stuff. And there were certain things that he could say to me after that that if he had said before that, I wouldn't even have known what he was talking about. Some wild woods out there. Well, you, you, you quit a show the way I did. You're going That's an education. I really don't recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> Public <laughs> service announcement yeah, from Dave time. Chappelle. I mean, I'm, I'm, it worked out all as well. It ends well, but you, you know, you don't know things are gonna work out. It's Wait, so why work. would you say you don't recommend it though? It's just difficult. It's just, it was a difficult time. Um, sp speaking of difficult time, let's just get this part in because we have to. Being on the airwaves, we haven't seen you since Charlie passed yeah, away, say we and he was a regular. You know, he was just in addition to everything on your show, frequent part of our lives in New York City on Hot ninety seven. Everywhere, just I, it must have been. It must have been pretty tough for you. That was real. I mean, you know, honestly, man, I uh, I didn't even know he was sick. And, I, and maybe I feel like I don't know, feel guilty about that or something. Like maybe I should. Check we didn't either. We didn't either, and he had come in, and none of us knew. But I, apparently, at the funeral, they, 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 there were people that were closer to him than I that, that, that and they didn't know. He was very he was very private about what he was going through. Um, but his his son gave a real uh, beautiful eulogy at the uh, at the funeral. And part of what he was saying was that his, you know, his father didn't like mourn himself. His dad had done everything that he, you know, wanted to do, and that was very, for me personally, that was very comforting. Um, and I, and I, I feel like, like, to say I was like grateful to meet that guy is is an understatement. I feel like one of the big reasons I'm successful is because of him. Like we all at lunch, and he just says something crazy like, "I fought Rick James many times." And that conversation changed my life. Like right. we made that sketch, and, and and it changed his life too. But it like like we, it's kind of like graduating together. Like we, you know, did this thesis, and everyone went on to do you know real great stuff. Uh, he was a very generous person, and he was hilarious, and and he was very wise. My favorite thing is that he didn't even know how funny he was. Like he might have known, bro. He's you think he knew? Cause even that, like, were you saying I fought Rick James many times? He's not thinking other thing other than reality. Like he's yeah. like that. Yeah, that's true. You know man. what I mean? But, he's not thinking about a sketch. He's not thinking that that shit is funny. Like I fought Rick James many times. <laughs> many, <it's> like, <laughs> like, oh yeah, that, that was just that. That was like lunchtime banter. That's what but, I'm saying. But yeah, I mean, but he knew it was interesting. Yeah. Right, right, right. When he knew it, it caught attention. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was, but it was a, uh, that was a tough year last year. I mean, losing like you know, Fife, you know, Prince, and Fife, and Shandling, and you know, Muhammad Ali, and this one and that one. Like, it, it's such a rapid succession, and and when a person like Charlie dies, honestly, it it makes you think of your own mortality, and like, oh, what am I? What is this all about? But his service was beautiful. Like, I was one joke I said at his funeral that it was funny. Well, I was like, I don't know any black person as famous as Charlie with this many black friends. It was funny, man. Like, but if you saw who was in the room, it was uh, it was a beautiful testament to what his life was about. Because the room was eclectic, man. And and a lot of people came out to pay their respects. So, yeah, man. And it must have always felt good, too, when you saw, you know, Charlie was a guy who grinded, didn't live on his brother's coattails, made his own way. And but after your show, you know, he had a great touring life for the rest of his career. You know, and obviously you say what he gave to your show, but it must have been nice for you to see what he gained from Chappelle's show. Oh my God, it was amazing. As a matter of fact, with all the comedians, you know, we sat together at the at the service, and you know, the guy, you know, they, you know, I got to hear a lot more about his life beyond Chappelle's show. I reached out to him when we just sat in our lab to see if he wanted to do sketches and stuff. And uh, he, he didn't call me back. I thought maybe, well, I don't know, was he mad? What's going on? I didn't know what was going on. And then unfortunately he was 
just dealing with health issues. And I, and I think he felt probably insecure because apparently he lost a lot of weight. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry to bring everyone down. No, that's, uh, nah, I brought that's it up. a beautiful Boy, story. Talk man. About it. Dave Chappelle, give it up for him. New shows just announced. Radio City Music Hall, you got it, Solange. Yep, the yeah. SNL cast. The SNL cast. Uh, uh, yeah. All Stars. Oh, yeah, man. Solange, SNL cast. Is, she's tickets are going like hotcakes. Miss Lauren Hill, Childish Gambito, Trevor Noah. Everybody, everybody in New York, man, thank you so much. The city was very good to me. Made a name for myself here. Found a wife from Brooklyn. Had two kids here. So I'm very grateful to the city of New York. I'm very grateful for you guys having me this morning. And hopefully I will see you guys at Radio City in the coming Oh, well, you're definitely going to see us. Are you popping up anywhere tonight? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't know. You know what I was thinking? I was said I should go do one of those. I used to do street comedy in Washington Square Park. And I've been fantasizing do recently it. about doing. But I don't want to do my act because, I, you know what I mean, I got to save everything I've written. I'm saving for Netflix. But that would, that would cause quite a, that would be quite a stir that would be caused if Dave Chappelle did a impromptu at Washington Square Park today. Oh uh, well, maybe not today, but then sometime I'm here for a month. It's the summertime but for nostalgia purposes. But I don't know how it works in New York if you need like permits or whatever. But you should I'm probably not, get a permit. Can you he really? just, probably want Can he just show up like at wow. twelve noon and just do it? Does he need a permit? I mean, just do it then. Yeah, if he doesn't have go, a huge system, go. he can do it. Absolutely, do it. See, uh, that's when Ebro's being a dick. That that's means he's something no, bad would happen. It'll be a news story. It'll be a great story. Dave Chappelle does show Washington Square Park. Yeah, Mayor no. says traffic. Uh, 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 shut up, God. God. Damn. <laughs> that happened to Portland, Portland, Oregon. They said it cost the city of Portland 200 grand. 6,000 people showed up. Yeah, that's police like, overtime. Whoops, so how whoops, would we whoops. find out if you pop up at Washington Square Park? <laughs> well, if you're there buying weedy, bro, which I heard is your habit. 